Good evening, everybody. We're just going to give a chance for people to come into the webinar, and then we'll get started here. Just hang in there with us for a minute here. Well, I'm going to get started. Uh, good evening. I'm Reg Hoyt. I'm the chair of the One Health Working Group here at Delaware Valley University. Welcome to our final and sixth One Health seminar of the spring semester. It's been a great semester. We've had some fabulous speakers. Uh, for those of you who made it out to A Day, hopefully you made it out to the outbreak exhibit from the Smithsonian. Uh, that was sponsored by the One Health Working Group as well. We had over 900 people visit that exhibit. So if you got a chance to see it, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Well, once again, I'm, I'm going to explain what One Health is to you. And uh, hopefully most of you have heard this many, many times before. Uh, my guess is you have your own definition of what One Health is. Uh, from my point of view, it's a very simple concept. Uh, we have one planet. Uh, we all share it whether we're humans, whether we're animals, whether we're plants, uh, and our future is bound together uh, in one way or another, whether it's for good or whether it's for bad. And those things that we decide to do have impacts on other uh, elements of the One Health triad. And in turn, that comes back and, and has an effect on us. Uh, and I, I prefer to think of this as well-being rather than necessarily health. Uh, this has been very oftenly focused on health, but I think well-being is a better term for it. Uh, for any of us who enjoy the outdoors, we certainly um, feel better being outside, uh, being in the environment, uh, enjoying plants and animals. And so I don't necessarily think that that's a measure of my health, but it certainly is a measure of my mental health and my mental well-being. Uh, here at DelVal, we kind of approach this from a couple of different directions. Let me see if I can get my slide to advance here. There we go. Uh, one is from education. Uh, we actually introduced this topic to our first year students within our uh, first year experiences. Uh, and many of the courses throughout the semester will be talking about issues from a One Health standpoint. Uh, and this is really truly a transdisciplinary approach, um, understanding that I may have my particular expertise in, in my particular discipline, but I gain a lot more from dealing with others' departments and with other uh, entities to try to answer the really complex questions that were faced at a local level or regional level, internationally, globally. Um, and one of the things that we want to promote is, is research that really approaches things from a transdisciplinary approach as well. Uh, today was Day of Scholarship here at Del Val, uh, and we had a number of student uh, research projects uh, that were presented. And clearly, you know, there's a need for crossing boundaries and, and getting out of one uh, silo and, you know, seeing what's happening in the other areas as well. And then finally, uh, the other thing that we do is outreach and the outbreak exhibit at A Day was one form of outreach, but every semester we have six seminars and we attempt to cover topics that are gonna be useful to those folks who are in our Ag and Environmental Science College and those who are in life and physical sciences and those who are in business and humanities. And uh, so we're always looking for new topics and new uh, presentations we want for the future. If you have ideas, do not hesitate to get in touch with me. And then tonight, we're also joined by Diane Smith from Bucks County Audubon Society, who is co-sponsoring this event. It's all yours, Diane. Well, I'm just thrilled to be here again. It's a, it's a wonderful seminar series. We're, we're very happy to, to co-sponsor it. Um, I'm not going to read the mission. You guys can read it on the screen. Um, but I will say that um, we are a chapter of the National Audubon Society, and we were founded in 1969. So we've been, you know, on um, working on this conservation and stewardship of land and wildlife and habitats for a very long time. 
our property is in addition a national historic landmark um, for agriculture. The Honey Hollow watershed was the first small watershed in the country um, where the landowners got together on a watershed basis rather than an individual property basis to do conservation work um, that included the entire watershed. So we're, we're very proud of our, our history of stewardship in that regard. Next slide. So a couple of things coming up that I encourage you to um, participate in. Um, we have a forest therapy walk coming up in a few weeks time. Um, there is a fee for that. Um, it's, it's done by a woman who is a certified forest therapist. Um, we have our spring wildflower walk and then we have our creek discovery walk coming up as well. Um, we also do bird walks on um, the first and third Saturdays of every month starting at 8 a.m. Um, I know there are some places around that start their bird walks at 7.30, but since I lead them, um, that's too early for me. Uh, and there are plenty of birds that wait until eight o'clock to get up as well. So um, that's uh, one of the things that, that we like to do. And we welcome everyone, even if you are not a birder, to come out and enjoy the environment, to enjoy the, the beautiful you know, spring mornings. Um, I have binoculars to lend, which I'm happy to do. I've done, um, I re repeatedly I've done um, beginning birding classes. So I'm quite um, good at helping people that have never done this before learn a little bit about how to look for birds and identify birds. And I, I just love sharing that kind of experience with, with just everyone. So um, I'm really happy to be here again. And uh, I hope that we see you out at the BCAS property in the near future. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. And uh, Chris, you can go ahead and bring up your presentation and I'll introduce you. So I'm very happy to, uh, again, since this was a day of scholarship at Del Val, it's very appropriate that we have one of our own here this evening. Dr. Chris Gambino is an assistant professor in animal science. Uh, he is passionate about feeding communities, both locally and globally, kind of a one health view here. Uh, has worked on projects connected to climate smart agriculture and nitrogen cycling in animal production systems. Uh, he's held appointments as a senior natural resource analyst at the University of Idaho's policy analyst group and as a breakthrough generation fellow at the Breakthrough Institute. Uh, he's assisted the AGRI, is that correct, Chris? AGRI Institute, uh, directed at Transforming Food and Agriculture Policy that was facilitated by the Meridian Institute. We are very happy to have you here. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Reg. Thanks, Diane, for the introductions. Uh, my talk is going to be on defining sustainable agriculture production in a changing climate, and it's, it's not so much a bait and switch. We're going to talk both climate from a um, atmospheric standpoint and environmental standpoint, but also climate in terms of uh, different identities that influence how we think about and how persons think about sustainable agriculture, which impacts what we do about the future. And so my major purpose is really in kind of talking about sustainable agriculture is to solve some emerging agricultural challenges. And, and we'll get into what some of those are, but it's kind of big. Uh, to do that, collectively, these challenges um, need to, and problems need to be well-defined or agreed upon. And, and that's a big question is whether or not they are. And so when it comes to kind of this notion of whether or not sustainable agriculture or kind of the challenges that agriculture face are well defined, uh, there's a couple, there's a bunch of literature out there suggesting that it's, it's hard. So from a, a more recent article, Hoffman et al, that studied kind of agroecological systems and, and how people think about those systems, uh, they noted that sustainability is, is really difficult to define, uh, which then makes it hard to practice due to these socio-ecological interactions. And we'll, we'll talk a little about those. Uh, and, and likewise, kind of those difficulties of being able to define and practice are exacerbated by what future practitioners, kind of the next generation, uh, need to settle in terms of questions. And some of those questions are that uh, Jules pretty talks about what is to be sustained, kind of for how long, who, for whose benefit, and at what cost, over what geographical area, and measured by what criteria. 
And so the term wicked problem then gets thrown around very often uh, when it comes to defining sustainable agriculture or agricultural issues in general. Uh, and it comes, it originates in the planning literature all the way back in the 1970s. Uh, and, and Horst Riddle kind of defined a wicked problem in that it's a place where scientific knowledge is incomplete, political values differ with regard to solutions, unknown long-term impacts are likely, and there's a high degree of complexity that surrounds the issue. Now, moreover, wicked problems occur in a social context, and so the wickedness of the problem actually reflects the diversity among stakeholders that are a part of the problem. Uh, thus, a key aspect in a preparation to solve wicked problems is understanding another's point of view. And unfortunately, too often, when looking, people are looking for solutions without spending the necessary time uh, adequately identifying problems and issues. And so when I talk about this in, in other courses and in, in, in policy courses, uh, I use this graphic to really kind of help people think through it. Uh, as we'll come to see, sustainability, particularly sustainable agriculture, isn't easily defined. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to hang out kind of right in this region, uh, noting that kind of problems, the way you define a problem kind of determines what goals you then set uh, or solutions you're trying to achieve. And then how you set your goals really impacts what you're going to measure. Uh, and then whatever you're measuring becomes your focus. Uh, and this can be good or bad. And we'll, we'll talk about kind of aspects of these. And then you can decide whether or not focusing on very narrow metrics is good for sustainable sustainability and, and one health paradigm, or if we need to take a more, a broader approach and, and look at multiple metrics. And so one way we can look at perceptions of sustainable agriculture is kind of how people organize their knowledge. Uh, and the way folks organize their knowledge can give us insights on potential decision-making behaviors and actions. And ultimately, actions and behaviors are what we're after when it comes to practices of sustainability or practices of one health. Uh, and if we'd like to see people practice sustainability in agriculture, then we need to first understand how they understand agricultural sustainability. And one method to do so is eliciting what's known as mental models. And so these are constructs that are really kind of a way to describe what, what people are, how they're organizing their knowledge. Uh, and then also they're, what we're grasping is these relationships between their values and beliefs and their cognitive processes that tie to their potential decision-making. Sustainability research are, are kind of using this currently to better understand decision-making in agroecological contexts. And so we're going to utilize it uh, to be able to capture stakeholders' represent representations of kind of the system. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. That's kind of the bulk of today's conversation. But first, like, what are perceptions of sustainable ag? And so what, what do people think about when they visualize sustainable agriculture? Well, if you do a quick Google search, uh, it can give some idea. The, the color green definitely seems to sustainable from kind of, if you just Google sustainable ag, uh, all these images might pop up on Google, uh, but maybe it's about smallholder farms. Maybe it's about uh, large, efficient acreage. Maybe it's about dirty hands. Uh, are animals allowed? None of these picture depict animals. So this is kind of one like really broad way, just Googling, but we're gonna dive in further. And so let's start by saying, okay, how, how do some institutions, how do those perceptions match institutional definitions? Well, well, NIFA, the USDA's kind of research arm around the, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, uh, if you apply for grants, they kind of have a definition in the federal code of record, and it's around the idea of sustainable agriculture seeks to provide more profitable farm income, promote environmental stewardship, and enhance the quality of life for farm families and communities. And there's the socio-ecological interactions that we talked about, they're important, remember, and at times sustainability kind of gets cast in these three pillars, right, boiled down to there's a social component, there's an environmental component, and there's an economic component. And they all need to be met concurrently, much like the One Health paradigm Reg, Reg mentioned. 
And so what we're going to do then is kind of take these, these concepts, these broad perceptions. And what I did was ask the student body, uh, the undergraduate student body at Delaware Valley University to answer this question, um, stating like agricultural sustainability means different things. How do you define agricultural sustainability? And I could have coded this in, in multiple ways. We had over 300 respondents in total, uh, about 204 of them I, I coded uh, at the time. So this was weeks back and we've gotten more since. And in those codings, I did very global codes. So I coded for the three pillars that I just mentioned, people, planet, and profit. And I coded for uh, much like Hoffman's work did, whether or not in these, in these conceptions, are they thinking about it in very concrete ways, like concrete strategies, or are they abstract goals? Uh, and, and examples of that could be, uh, it's better for the environment. That's abstract. Uh, and an example of a concrete strategy would be reduced tillage or reduced pesticide use, very concrete ideas of what it would look like to be agriculturally sustainable. And so what you see here is the global mental model picked it as a map of concepts that were coded across all 204 students that answered the question. I'll break it down into categories in a moment by their major discipline. But right now, this is everyone. And from this, and I'll show a couple slides in a moment that have bar graphs, and, and maybe they're more traditional to see the information, we can see that abstract goals, by and large, are the most, con or I shouldn't use concrete, are the most centered, uh, connected concept. And so most of what people use to define agriculture sustainability was an abstract goal, not a concrete strategy. Uh, and those abstract goals tied the width of these lines are how connected these ideas are when someone's describing agricultural sustainability. And that means that abstract goal and these, these other nodes, these other circles, if this line is really thick, that they showed up a lot of times together in, in, in different definitions. And so the thickest, the biggest connection, the strongest connection is between abstract goals and planet. And so what that says is from all 204 people that answered this question, they, they most strongly connect, they have an abstract idea of what sustainab agricultural sustainability means, and it's usually tied to something about the environment, the planet, the land. Uh, that's what fits in this like planet context. The next biggest connection is between, again, abstract goal, so this abstract idea, not a concrete idea, and people component. But one thing to pull out here in terms of people, it's not necessarily social justice oriented, uh, it could be farm oriented, much like the, USA, the USDA definition about farm families, or oftentimes it was, it was just about future generations. So very abstract in that sustainability is about future generations, but nothing concrete. And then often about uh, consumers, like providing enough food for people. And so this people context can get broken out further. I did not do that in this moment but that was the next biggest connection. And so to, the takeaway is abstract is kind of the center of this idea. So in the number of cases, percent cases, you can see 72% of the, the cases and a case is a person. So 72% of the respondents said something that had to do with an abstract goal. Only 12.6% said had a, had a concrete strategy attached to what agricultural sustainability is. And then you can see by and large, uh, most of the cases, almost half the cases had uh, this idea of planet. So the environment being a part of what it means. And then the, the next biggest portion being people. And the lowest is often, and I, I think that folks may understand this, is that Profit doesn't usually tie to this, even though it is part of that pillar, even though USDA has it, uh, profit doesn't necessarily tie to how people think about agricultural sustainability. And I think that's important. And we'll talk about why in a moment. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but this is percent of codes. So most of what was stated was abstract goals again. And, and that's just reiterating that point. So now I'm going to transition and we're going to 
tie into, and I, I recognize you can't read the word, so I'm going to help you here, tie into the different majors. So how did it specifically tie to each of these disciplines? Uh, because again, as Reg mentioned, I think it's really important that we move forward in a cross-disciplinary or an interdisciplinary manner and come out of silos. That's my goal. And so if we look at animal science major where I'm housed as a professor, uh, we had the most respondents, uh, 54 uh, cases here. And again, the strongest connections in the animal science student mind around agricultural sustainability is abstract and tied to planet and people. One thing to note is that there was a presence. So some of these cases did say something concrete. And in that, these concrete strategies were tied to all three pillars for the animal science student. Uh, concrete strategy around planet, concrete strategy around people, and also concrete strategies around profit. When looking at the agribusiness student majors, uh, again, the major connection is abstract and it's to planet and people, but they had, agriculture, agri agribusiness students, had the strongest connection of concrete strategies uh, in any of the different mindsets of our undergraduate students. And they too connected concrete strategies to profits, to people, and to planet. When looking at the conservation of wildlife management students, uh, again, abstract in planet, most pronounced, strongest connection. Uh, but here you note that concrete strategies weren't present. So in the way that a conservation wildlife management student defines agricultural sustainability, it is solely based on these 28 respondents, a abstract concept, uh, nothing concrete. When looking at plant science students, they had concrete strategies show up and their concrete strategies tied to profit, to planet and to people as well. And they too had the strongest connection between abstract and planet and abstract and people. A couple more majors before we move on. We have biology majors, business and humanities majors, kind of coalesced, education majors, and zoo science majors. And similar concepts. You can see the thickest line between people or planet and abstract goals. So meaning like what they think about agricultural sustainability is abstract and connected to the environment. It's an abstract environmental thought. Uh, similar to business and humanities, it's that business and humanities don't have, much like conservation and wildlife management students, a, a concept or the way they're conceptualizing as concrete strategies. Education students have concrete strategies, uh, but not tied to any particular pillar. Uh, they just showed up connected uh, somewhere in there. And then zoo science students had concrete strategies they connected to people and planet, but their concrete strategies did not connect to the pillar of profit. And so one further step is to, to pull apart this from a political lean, which was a question asked. And I think this is going to be important as we move forward. And this is part of the climate side of the conversation is how do we coalesce these, these two particular groups of people to move forward on an area of agriculture that I think both are tied to. And so asking this question, if we tease it between Democrat leaning and Republican leaning, we have about 90 versus 109. And what we can see from the, the Democratic student mindset or the student that leans more Democratic is a really tight triangle between abstract goals and planet and people. Uh, they are, ha they do have concrete strategies in here. Uh, those concrete strategies only tie to planet and people. Whereas in the, the students, the leading Republican mindset when defining agricultural sustainability uh, also has that really tight knit triangle. So abstract goals are still the most center and connected to planets and people. But when thinking about concrete strategies, those concrete strategies now tie to people, planet, and profit. And so I think this extra line here is something we need to focus on and have a, a conversation between this group and this group, because I think that conversation helps broaden the definition of sustainability. And as we move to define things, remember there's social context tied to it. 
Uh, we need to have a breadth of conversation, a breadth of a definition so that we can create goals that actually are going to achieve something that's more diverse than very specifically measured things. Uh, and that's why it kind of ties back into this because based on everything I just showed you, by and large, everything's pretty abstract. And maybe you're thinking, okay, well, what if you ask them directly about strategies, they probably would have included some. And yeah, that's probably true. But what's important here is how the next generation is actually conceptualizing agricultural sustainability. And as presented, those conceptions are abstract. So there's an idea, but little concrete direction connected to that idea. And those abstractions, going back to, to Pretty's comments, often lead to disagreement and ambiguity about issues and solutions. And so we need to have a, a much clearer, uh, well-defined here so that we can move forward and understand what we're, what we're achieving and what we're measuring to make sure we're getting to whatever sustainability looks like. And so what, what does someone actually measure to determine whether a system is sustainable or becoming more sustainable? Well, there's a whole list here and I, I'm positive that you could add to this list, right? This is not an exhaustive list, but when measuring sustainability, we could talk about uh, cycling of nutrients. So nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, uh, where those flows are, how do we retain it into the soil? How do we make sure it's not running off? How do we make sure it's not volatizing into the atmosphere? Uh, we can talk about water quality impacts. Okay, What is running off in the water? Is it bacteria? Is it nutrients that we don't want there at that point in time? We can talk about water use. Okay, where is, where is water getting allocated? Right, We're not seeing that so much in the eastern part of the country yet, but that is a very prevalent issue uh, as we move westward. Air quality impacts, waste generation disposal, antibiotic use, uh, hormone use, land use and change, greenhouse gas emissions. We can talk about nutrition, health, access to nutritious food, right? Getting closer to that social side of the pillar, uh, social welfare of laborers, uh, community welfare. We can talk about animal welfare, right? These are things that we have some concepts to, but there's so many things that we could actually measure and that, that could just essentially be more sustainable. And so I'm gonna walk through one kind of thought experiment uh, before we move on to, to more survey questions. And so say you wanna think about sustainability from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, right? That's kind of one of the big looming ones that we see often in the news. Uh, well, there's a bunch of gases that contribute to, to the greenhouse gas effect. Uh, by and large, right, the blue here, it's, it's carbon. It's carbon dioxide. Okay, that's the biggest one. We can see how big the blue line is from 1990 to present day. Okay. And then we dig deeper, right? This is coming straight from the US EPA greenhouse gas inventory that's most recent, 2021. We're looking at, okay, what sector now? and they're doing it by economics, so money generating sector, is the most greenhouse gas intensive. Uh, and often in the news, we're focusing on agriculture, but you see agriculture being like 10.2% of the US's pot. And that's important. And so when we think about metrics, and I'm not going to take a lot of time here, if we step back, you have to really look at what's being stated, because if it is ag, it could be global ag. And global ag emissions are going to be bigger than U.S. ag emissions from a greenhouse gas perspective, because this happens due to more pastoral animal ag versus more of an intensified animal ag. And that's something you have to differentiate when someone's giving you a statistic about ag's emissions. So in the U.S., being a little bit more intensive, much less emissions from livestock, only 4% of that pot is associated with livestock. Okay, and so that's kind of where we're starting. So if we want to tackle greenhouse gas emissions, it may be over here. Can we do better here? Probably, but can we, can we do much better at tackling the problem over here? Also probably. But say, say it's not greenhouse gas emissions, say it's, it's land use. Well, yes, but, but cattle use and livestock use a lot of land. Okay, we'll talk through that. Uh, and so this is coming from a Bloomberg article in 2018. Uh, each, each of these squares is like a quarter million acres, and you can see the colors. Uh, and then you can see them, they truncated it for us. So we have to look at all the little dots and count them up. Uh, the majority of, of our land mass is being used for pasture or rangeland. Then we have forested land, crop land, special use, miscellaneous, and, and urban land. 
Okay, so yes, the majority is range and pasture land, and we'll talk about that. Okay, but if we dig into the crop land, okay, the crop land is being used for a ton of things. It's about one fifth of our country's land area, 32.5% uh, of which, so this 127 million acres, is dedicated to livestock feed. So you've got pasture land plus this portion now tied to animals. Okay, and then the rest of it's going export market and then a, a smaller portion kind of to what we eat. Okay, if we look at kind of what we eat, uh, a lot of it's going to things that you may or may not know, like buy right off the shelf, but are in products that you're buying uh, at, as well. So not something you're specifically buying. And then you've got kind of your fruit and veg being a smaller portion of that land. And I think that's important to note. So land, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, land use. So say we're leaning on land use. So what do we do about that land use? Well, there's, there's two conversations and this comes out of, <clears throat> there's actually a really good science article uh, that you can go back and look and, and you can email me if you, if you want that reference. Uh, and then as at my time at Breakthrough Institute, there was kind of a back and forth debate. Uh, they really pride themselves on achieving disagreement. And so the science article got debated with the Breakthrough Institute and they went back and forth, kind of arguing the merits of these two ideas, land sharing versus land sparing. So maybe we've got land use still, but it's not just land use, it's the idea of biodiversity of, of all things in how we're using land. And so the land sharing concept says, okay, let's have more like speckled land use so that the plots are more diverse. So we've got kind of farmland next to uh, livestock areas, next to kind of gardens, next to floor, forests, next to all these things kind of intermixed. That's the land sharing concept versus land sparing, which is more oriented to, okay, what if we actually intensified agriculture and then made more land space available for all the other biodiverse things we want, conserve protected land. If we use less land for ag by making it more intense, then maybe we can achieve the same biodiversity benefits through protected land. And this was a debate. Uh, and, and there's no there's no true answer because there's a lot of research saying, and this isn't my field of expertise, saying that even with big land areas set aside for protected uh, space, that we'll still see species extinction because they cannot move well. Uh, and so, that's still part of the debate, but there is this notion of, okay, maybe we can achieve both things by intensifying. So we're back to kind of land use. Connected to land use, if we talk about all that range land, right, that's a lot of land in the U.S. that's being used for range or pasture. But what we don't necessarily tie to that often is the fact that it's not heritable. We, you can't go out with a tractor and, and plant crops, right? It's not heritable land, but ruminants in particular can go out and wander it, gain solar energy from the cellulose they're consuming in their forages, and produce a product. And so Christian Peters back in 2016 evaluated a bunch of diets. And I'm going to go through this way faster than it's going to do it justice, uh, but there's so many diets. These are all omnivore diets, uh, kind of reducing meat consumption. This is an ovolactarian diet. This is a lacto-vegetarian diet compared to a vegetarian diet. And I kind of think these are the two that I want to focus on. And his goal was, okay, calorie for calorie, let's make sure they're all eating the same calories. We're going to match the U.S. calorie needs. Which of these diets is going to be most beneficial for carrying the capacity of the U.S. population? And what Dr. Peters found was it's actually the lacto-vegetarian diet that can carry the most people. And so if we're talking about this one health perspective, uh, as a society, right, population needs to get fed. <clears throat> and in feeding that population, we can feed the most people through dairy and a vegetarian diet. Now, I'm not adding any context to that, but to say that in their interpretation of it is because that the, the dairy cow can convert cellulosic material that we can't into a high highly nutritious product that's got fats and proteins in it. And so that ability to utilize that rangeland and, and our dairies aren't set up to be that rangeland, but could they potentially? So this diet actually can feed the most people. And I think our population is going to continue to grow. And so we have to have that part of the breadth of conversation there. 
So as we transition out, right, we've got all these metrics. When you look at these metrics, we need to then think back to, okay, when we're defining and thinking about the social context, all the stakeholders involved, which of these can we move forward on? And which of these are going to be able to be moved forward on with voluntary efforts? So someone's just going to take up some type of, of best practice voluntarily, maybe it's incentivized, or which of these are going to have to be mandated? Because when you look at these, nitrogen, so nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, these don't stay on a particular property, right? They don't stay on a farm. Water doesn't stay on a farm. Air moves across boundaries. Okay, so a lot of these are transboundary issues, and we're going to talk about those in a moment. And so the crux of this notion of like liberty, the liberty problem that, uh, that this is my land and I can make my own decisions on it, sometimes becomes this uh, idea about curtailing this individual liberty for uh, to be necessary to preserve the community in which all citizens are free. And that's this, 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 the crux of the liberty problem. And we're going to dive into that because I asked about it in the survey. And so there's two concepts of liberty or freedom, whichever you want to tie to. There's a negative and there's a positive. The negative, and this comes from literature that, that is not, I didn't come up with this. The negative concept is that freedom from coercion, that, that no, one's, no one's interfering with you doing anything. Versus the positive concept is that that person now is free to be able to go about and do things. They can realize all their dreams and goals. And that's an important distinction. And we'll talk about that as it applies to sustainability in agriculture. And so there was a question that, that was asked about those two things, the concepts of freedom and liberty. And breaking that apart by political lean, identified students that are Democrat versus identified students that are Republican, <clears throat> there's a statistical significant difference between how they view that concept. And so the students that identified as leaning Democratic were significantly more likely to see the concepts of freedom and the concepts of liberty as being able to realize one's goals, as opposed to having no interference. And when you look at that, it's not just that variable, but it's, it's across, so holding age, holding gender, holding race, holding years in school constant, that still remains significant in that as for every, every movement towards uh, being more Republican than Democrat leaning, there's a decrease in the freedom variable, meaning they're more likely to see freedom as no one interfering, not as achieving, being able to achieve one's goals that they set out to, to achieve. Same thing for liberty. Okay, So the holding age, gender, race, years in school con constant, the political lean moving more towards Republican uh, leads to a decrease in the liberty variable that there is more likely to see liberty as no one interfering. Now, that has huge implications. That single idea of like freedom as stay out of my way has huge implications for all aspects of sustainability. Environmental issues, like I mentioned, are not isolated to an individual property, right? They're transboundary. We see this with the Chesapeake Bay watershed, right? Water is not staying on that property up north. It's impacting everything downstream, down that watershed. Air quality, not isolated. You're seeing particulate matter 2.5 here. This is what my doctoral research looked at, modeling 2 PM 2.5. You can see it moving across boundaries. A lot of these are connected to concentrated uh, feeding areas, but they're also connected to other industrial areas. And so they're moving. It's, it's emitted somewhere, but it's, it's impacting all over the place. There are also social implications uh, of a willingness to support budgets that provide for programs like SNAP. And so if, if there's this idea that no one in my way versus I'm going to help people be able to conceive their goals and dreams, that's how I see liberty or freedom, that has implications for budget support. And in this book, uh, Jim Wallace states that budgets are moral documents. And if that's true, that places a pretty hefty weight on the go where government decides to or should dedicate funds that are around environmental and agricultural issues. There are profit implications in terms of this because subsidies are, aren't sustainable, and yet subsidies are part of that budgetary conversation if we're going to support others. 
right? If I'm going to help others support their dreams, I'm going to support them in disaster programs. I'm going to provide insurance, right? These are all taxpayer dollars going to these. And that, that has connections to the individual liberty and freedom conversation. And, and by and large, I, su I support working with farmers on this. But I often think that people's assumption of, of where these dollars go is helping your neighbor, right? The small farmer. But when you look at the actual percentage, over half of it, over greater than 50% of these payments are going to farms that are wealthier than your neighbor. And so that's something we've got to consider when it comes to the sustainability conversation. Lastly, connecting these concepts of freedom and liberty. Um, when we look at solely profit motivated, which profit isn't bad. So let's make that very clear, right? It is a pillar for a reason because subsidies aren't sustainable. If an entity isn't making money year after year, they can't stay in business. So that needs to be tied. So profit isn't bad, but when we're solely profit motivated and we're not thinking about the people pillar or the planet pillar, uh, we exploit land and people. And David Montgomery does a good job depicting this in the book, Dirt. Uh, so as we, as we move to survive, we can continue to expand. And he, he maps the expansion westward from the first colonies and societies begin to fall because they fail to feed their population. And he ties us all the way back into history about potential variables that impact the fall of society. And those falls are tied to this expansion of land without regard to labor or the land itself. And so thankfully, and, and Reg meant, mentioned Agree, who I worked for a while back as a fellow, is working to connect ag risk, right? Because I, I think, this is my personal opinion now, I think we should support uh, and, and all take on the risk because agriculture is risky, right? You can't predict climate. You can't predict a lot of things. So we should shoulder that risk together and, and provide for farmers and ranchers but Agree is looking at how do we do that in the best way possible? And so this is very recent work and they're moving this, I'm, I'm hoping this is gonna get moved in the, to the 2023 Farm Bill, the case for next generation crop insurance. And so what they're looking at is they're tying, okay, how risky is your agriculture business based on the practices you're using, right? If you're not using best management practices, then maybe your crop insurance premium should be higher because there's more risk associated with it. But if you are using these best management practices that science and technology have, have helped define, then maybe you should have a reduced crop insurance premium because your risk isn't as high. And so that's the movement forward here. And it's connecting back to kind of, are we going to help the, the collective, the community be able to achieve their goals? Or are we going to be a barrier in, in front of them? And so crop insurance helps folks be able to conceive and achieve their goal. To, to come back, I don't, want, I don't want the Democratic and Republican kind of side of this thing to, to skew what's going on because it's not, yes, it's statistical, but when you look at it, so this is concept of freedom, I'll show liberty next, green being the Democratic leaning student, yellow being the Republican leaning student. When you look at the no interference versus freedom, the statistics come because these two are so different, but there's still a, a large majority of, or there's still a large population of, of Republican leaning students that do see the concept of freedom, as well as I'll show in a moment, the concept of liberty as being able to conceive goals. And so if you were to probably take this data, and this isn't new, like this question dates a while back and, and, and these results aren't new by leaning of political affiliation. But I would, I would venture if you were to take, provide this survey a decade, 20 years ago, that you wouldn't see this yellow bar so high over here. And so I think this is an important thing to note is that the students that do lean this direction are, are more complex in how they're thinking about things. So they are seeing it as potentially capable of conceiving own goals and realizing them. And I think going back to this notion of how do we break silos, we have this idea to start talking about. How do we, across these two populations, talk about what does it look like for everyone to be able to conceive of their own goals and realizing them from an agricultural context? 
How do we get people land? Land's hard to access. How do we get people land to farm? What does that look like? What policy program can get put in place to be able to do that? Not, not to belabor the points, I'm not going to stand here, but the same thing for liberty in terms of the bars. So to get back to the concrete ideas, science and technology are often the underpin of those concrete strategies, right? We talked about how abstract things were for creating agriculture sustainability. So for example, <clears throat> to understand how cover crops impact erosion or how riparian buffers impact runoff or how fertilization rates uh, or application of fertilizer impact leaching and runoff as well, we use science. And often then new technology can arise. So when we look at how different the ideas around where science holds value from an environmental issue standpoint, uh, it starts to unpack some things for us. So I asked students a, a big sweeping part of questions about kind of uh, the 20, a 30 question set. One of those questions was, okay, talk about your agreement or disagreement. Uh, on how science offers a better, on the statement, science offers a better way to learn the truth about environmental issues than alternative claims to truth. And so when we look at a bunch of different independent variables and their impact on the agreement or disagreement of the statement, we found two things. Okay, and so a bunch of stuff's going on here, disregard all of it, except for when you look at this column, look at what's below 0 0.05. And so what this is showing right here is that as you move from a younger student, so freshman compared to sophomore, junior, senior, they have more, uh, the freshmen have more disagreement in this statement, so science offering better alternative. As you move up from junior, sophomore to junior, senior, so as you increase your time in this system, right, your four years at this institution, they end up having less disagreement in this statement meaning they potentially see science as offering some truth. When we look at political lean again, which is really important here, it's significant. And so it predicts disagreement in the statement. And because it's negative, as you move from one to two, which is essentially uh, meaning that leaning Democrat compared to leaning Republican is associated with less, because it's negative, less disagreement in science offering a better truth uh, and that's significant. So as you move from Democrat to Republican, uh, the Democrats compared to the Republicans see this as they, they agree more with the statement than the Republicans leading students. Now, I need to pause and make sure that you hear what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm, I am not saying farmers are uneducated and I'm not saying farmers aren't knowledgeable. They, they are. And my time across the, the country in Washington, North Carolina, Virginia, and here in Pennsylvania, I know several brilliant farmers and ranchers. I am saying this has right here, this has implications on how problems are defined. And then in, in consequence, how solutions are designed. So it's unlikely that technocratic decision will work. So it's unlikely that we can just hand off science and, and we're gonna see people implement practices. And this isn't news. So extension educators have known this for a while. Uh, and this 538, a ton of them have commented on this very recent, a couple of days ago, 538 publication. Uh, so this isn't news to extension educators. And also Faith, Faith Kearns, and I discussed this very thing in her, her newest book about getting to the heart of science communication. And a blend of science and experiential knowledge, which, which is really science itself, will be what wins the day, right? That's at the heart of this. And, but that kind of experiential actually takes deeper relationship. So to, to be the extension educator, and to combine the experiential knowledge of the farmer rancher on the ground, that takes a deeper relationship between the science practitioner and communicator and that, and that person on the ground, the farmer, or the rancher, which means then that takes more time. 
which means we aren't going to, based on all of this, we're not going to see sweeping changes in the management and impacts in the near term. It's going to take that, that deep work together to be able to combine science and experiential knowledge. To take it one step further, this also isn't not known. Uh, there's several books on how knowledge and environmental issues intertwine. Uh, and Toddy Steelman, one of the authors of this book, has written about this for her entire career. And so based on what I've learned from Toddy and my own experience is that I value local knowledge. And so just because someone sees less truth in science doesn't mean we force technocratic solutions. Because I think that actually the disregard for local knowledge has led to what we've seen with the treatment of indigenous persons and their land. There's several new books out talking about it. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the start of the environmental movement where indigenous persons were said to be impacting this pristine area and the environmental movement then would rather remove them from that pristine area than see that, that area being worked from the indigenous population. So local knowledge has value. We need to figure out how to integrate that knowledge. And this again goes down to breaking the silos between academia and people on the ground. So we really need to be careful then in unpacking all these results because farmers and ranchers do have knowledge that scientists won't be able to prove. And so we got to figure out what do we do with that knowledge? And like I told Reg from the start of this, and I told Diane that I'm, I'm probably going to open up more questions than I'm going to answer. Because based on the survey, we see a lot going on with the student population. And I, and I care more about the next generation and, and how they're going to be able to manage these problems, right? If we go all the way back to the purpose, it's we've got to solve emerging agricultural challenges. And so what do we do about that? And I, I purposely, I've got like a bunch of other slides that I'm not going to show, but I purposely left this slide blank to, to end here. And it looks like we're right about time to end here and take questions and also open it for ideas of, okay, so what, what do we do next? And so Reg, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll take questions whenever you got a chance. All right. Well, uh, again, everybody, please put your questions into Q&A. Uh, and there was a question about whether this was recorded and would be available later on. Absolutely. Uh, all of our seminars are recorded and will eventually show up at uh, www.delval.edu forward slash One Health. Uh, and so uh, that should be posted within a couple of days of the of the presentation. We also had another comment. Uh, this was from Michelle. It is my feeling that yes, we as a country must help fortify farmers financially in the U.S. to keep them in business, as to not lose more acres of domestic food source. Increasing our dependency on foreign food in the future will be the downfall of the United States. We already import more than 50% of our fresh fruit and vegetables in the U.S. Therefore, subsidizing farms is the right thing to do. Government has subsidized other industries in the past that are not as essential as agriculture. Any comments on that, Chris? I, I'm, I'm, I've seen Michelle teach and, and I, I agree with her statements that we've got to back to the, the moral document conversation, we've got to figure out kind of, there's a, there's a pot of money and, and where do we put it? And I think feeding people is a, a Park Wild, who I quoted earlier uh, in his book says like society's major function is to figure out how to feed its population. That's, that's one of the core aspects of what society needs to, to wrestle with. And so I would agree that we've got to figure out a way to make sure we can produce food. And that ties back into this whole theme of, okay, now, how do we do that sustainably? What are we saying sustainable agriculture is? Well, we have a question from Anonymous. Uh, Dr. Gambino talked about nutrition and health being part of sustainable ag, among other things. If anything, what is Del Val doing or what could we do to make our school more sustainable on the animal nutrition side of things? Yeah, so I I'm, I don't know the the exact tie to animal nutrition side of things on our end, but I would say we we could do a lot of 
stuff potentially, and we'd have to weigh the, the pros and cons, but we do produce uh, some forages on campus. So we're keeping things local as to most, most livestock farms are producing some type of forage on campus and feeding it to their animals. We could produce more on campus, uh, be efficient in utilizing our acreage there. We could graze and produce and hay. Uh, we're doing that a lot of that at Roth, our, our Center for Sustainable Agriculture. And we could feed byproducts uh, from other industry. And often we do do that. I know the dairy often takes uh, bread that's, that's not being used at the grocer anymore. And so big totes of uh, bread will come and students will have to throw that into the TMR mixer. And so we're recycling uh, human, human waste food. Now the bread's still good. It's not moldy. It's not bad. It just giant or whomever got rid of it. And so we can do more of that. From Rebecca, uh, how can we as ag advocates share our view on sustainability with our consumers, noting that profit is important as well as caring for the planet? Yeah, this goes back to that, that communications aspect and, and part of the conversation. Um, sharing, your, sharing your story is important. I often hesitate to like provide a prescription um, because communication can quickly become manipulation. And I would, I would strongly advise against trying to communicate in a way that's going to persuade someone versus just being true to what you're doing. And, and if you want to, you want to go down that road and there's, there's actually grants and I don't know where you're located, but there's grants in Pennsylvania that, that help uh, for value added products that you can get money for. Um, and then there's, and I don't want to promote, promote anyone group, but Kinchy Table Consultants is a group that I've worked with in the past, and they are often working with smallholder farmers and to, to get their budget in order to help them figure out how to make sure they're sustainable from a, a profit standpoint and get their food to market and kind of do that whole well-rounded kind of budget and marketing side of things for, for farmers and producers. So I think there's organizations like that that can help you do it. Uh, but I, I hesitate to give you like a prescription of this is what you say to get people to buy your products. I think there's a, a bunch of avenues and, and there's definitely grant support to help bolster small farmers and, and get products to market. Diane asks, has the community supported agriculture movement had an impact? So interestingly, CSA is I, I they ebb and flow and I haven't looked at the most recent data. I think they kind of during the pandemic jumps and skyrocketed in, in kind of shares being being asked for and ordered. I think where community supported agriculture has the, the biggest place is, is the conversation of risk that, that Michelle was tying to earlier is that's its whole premise is you're buying in ahead of time and you're sharing the risk with that farmer. And so if you can get those things to scale, then I think they do have a place because it's very similar to crop insurance, but crop insurance has historically not been available for fruit and veg. And so CSA has been most typically fruit and veg. And so if we can share risk in whatever that risk sharing looks like, it's going to be good for agriculture. Aid uh, writes, uh, since, the food, since food is the biggest worry about agriculture, should there be more awareness about cross-playing those students that are food science majors? I know of a good amount of food shortage is happening. So would adding their local knowledge as food scientists be important and valuable also? So food, it depends on kind of what the food science majors are focused on. Uh, a lot of food science majors are, are kind of looking at product preparation and, and preservation. And I think that's, that's part of it. We can either, I think we need both sides of, of the spectrum. We can either look to localize things so that you're getting it quicker, so it's not going to spoil faster, or we can add science to the, to the equation and have longer shelf lives so things don't spoil faster and so we're not wasting food. I think food science has a, a major role in helping us combat foodborne diseases uh, and as well as combating food waste. And so that's where I'd say their knowledge is going to be very impactful in, in how we answer this sustainability question around as we step away from just agricultural sustainability and go to like the entire food system conversation. 
Maria Elena has uh, this to say, I actually am writing my senior capstone paper on why we need to make the switch to sustainable agriculture and move more so away from industrialized ag. However, I ask this main question, is it possible to make a more sustainable impact and make these switches while still being able to feed the amount of people we need to in such a short amount of time? That is where industrialized agriculture comes into play vertically integrated systems, quicker turnaround, and massive CAFOs? Yeah, so that's, Maria Elena, that's a good question. I have, let's see how I can do this. Let's see, I've got a bunch of stuff hidden here. All right, so these essentially are from a 2008 paper. And, and what Galloway and, and colleagues mapped was nitrogen flow from, from different products. So this is from, nitrogen flow from fertilizer, nitrogen flow from grain trade and nitrogen flow from meat trade. Uh, I think when you get to that conversation and, and I'm gonna you know, say something that might be unsettling, you have to think about the role of export. If, if and, I've, and I've heard USDA undersecretaries say this in meetings while I was working with Agree, whether or not we, we decide that US's role is feeding the world or not. And, and that is a really sticky issue to wrestle with industrial agriculture helps us do that. It, the question is whether or not it's, it's the US's role to, to be a part of that. When you start talking about economics, right, that's gonna international export, we're in a globalized economy. And so that plays a lot of factor in, you can see it in these images through grain trade that there's a lot of nitrogen leaving the US and going elsewhere. And then we've got to replenish that nitrogen in our soils. And then now they have all this extra nitrogen because Humans aren't super efficient, so that nitrogen is going to get wasted as they digest it. And this is what the picture looks like in, in globalized food trade. So that's, there's, I don't have an answer for you, but that's the question they have to wrestle with is whether or not the U.S. should be. And that, that normative question of should isn't something that I'm trying to tackle right now. All right, we've got a few more questions here, trying to uh, be respectful of time here. Uh, this is from Anonymous. Do you believe that your next step into sustainability is all organic practices, or do you believe that small steps in the direction of sustainability is the best for the future of agriculture? Yes, yeah, so from the organic perspective, the, the heart of organic, there's a lot of principles that tie to One Health, that tie to a lot of the metrics that I said we could utilize to define agricultural sustainability. I think that we have to be open to ideas. And I, so I think there's a blend. Uh, is it going to be all organic? I think that'd be a, a hard tradition, a transi transition. And so we've got to figure out kind of the blend between the two. I think there's practices in organic that we can use. And then there's practices that we can use that don't tie people to these rules under organic. And so in any mandated system, there's going to be loopholes or there's going to be things that, uh, that limit or hamstring a producer's ability to, to do good work. And so we've got to be cognizant of that. So do I think organic is the solution? I, I wouldn't say that it's the silver bullet. I would say that there's principles in organic that we know already from science that work well. Does it have to be organic to implement those principles? I don't think so. From Claire, uh, where do you see livestock and pastures in the future of sustainable ag? It seems like one of the most sustainable things we can do is reduce meat in our diet. So there's, so based on Christian Peter's work, there, there is that aspect of it. If you're on the, the lacto vegetarian diets, right, cows get old. And so we, we can gain milk from them. And then when cows get old, we can, we can have meat from them. So I think understanding the where they plug into that meat production system is important. And then, like I mentioned, with regard to that big swath of land in the US, the range and pasture land, it's not heritable. And so what do we do with it? Uh, one way we can utilize it, and we can do this well, and we, we have to be smart about managing it, because this is mostly continuous grazing. No one's throwing up electric fences in, you know, North Dakota and Wyoming, they're just letting animals graze. If we manage those lands well, which a lot of it actually is government land, it's federal land, uh, and there's some private land, then 
we can create meat without taking up land area that could be used for something else like growing fruits and vegetables uh, and certainly not used for development's sake if, if more housing is needed in the future. So we have that land. I think we can utilize it. I think we have to manage it well, but we can keep meat in our diet if we're utilizing that range and pasture land well. The question becomes whether or not we go about that land sharing versus land sparing and whether or not we intensify animal agriculture and how that impacts things when now you're growing crops to feed livestock as well. And I think there's a balance there also. And our last question, which I think is quite fitting, this is from Elizabeth. In your survey, you gather data from multiple majors here on campus, each garnering different results when defining sustainability. Would you correlate these differences, abstract versus concrete, human focus versus world, to the different mind frames and focuses that each of these majors have? And how do you see the different perspectives of each of these majors interconnecting and impacting future sustainability in relation to the One Health Initiative? Yeah, Lizzie, that's a great question. So what I plan to do next, there's a lot of information still sitting there that hasn't been um, analyzed. So there were, there were three inventories, all well-known, uh, two of which tie to more specific to like One Health paradigm conversations. There's the good farmer inventory that Jean McGuire, uh, when she was at Iowa State, looked at kind of how do these, these 31 questions, how do farmers, and they're mostly kind of Midwest crop, crop farmers, think about these issues? And then she was able to come up with four identities, conservationist, naturalist, civic-minded, uh, and then productivist. What I plan to do is, is analyze those items on the student population. And then I can track and see and did major predict whether or not the person's a productivist, a naturalist, a conservationist. Uh, same thing with the ecotypes questions that Jim Proctor at uh, Lewis and Clark in Portland. And, and I recommend everyone to kind of go look at and take that survey. We, uh, I've worked with him and he pulled, he allowed us to use it. Those items he's starting to piece together in, in how different people see the world from, you know, is, should nature remain wild and pristine or can humans be a part of altering nature? Uh, and, and he's got some, again, identities that come from that when they cluster those. And I hope to track back those identities to different majors. And so we'll see how majors play out in a lot of different ways. Based on the mental models, yeah, the way I the way I explained it, there's some nuanced differences. But when you've got 12 students versus 54 students, generalizing becomes pretty difficult. Well, I think we ought to wrap it up there, Chris. This has been a fabulous end to our One Health semester. Uh, this is a, a talk that I think is going to carry on for quite some time. And I would like to suggest that maybe this is a great start to a conversation about a sustainability capstone course. Uh, again, you know, pulling together students from all majors uh, to look at some solutions, you know, and maybe at a regional level or local level or um, even a global level. Uh, I thank you very much. I thank Diane and Bucks County Audubon Society for being our co-sponsor this evening, and thank all of you for attending. Uh, keep in mind, uh, this is recorded and will be available at the One Health site uh, within a couple of days. Um, thank you very much. I hope everybody has a great evening. Chris, have a great evening. Thanks. Go get some dinner. <laughs> See you. Yeah. Good night, everybody.